Good evening. We, we're ready to uh, start the hearing on City Council Bill 12-0152. If I could have everyone's attention, please, I would appreciate it. Uh, good evening, uh, council members and audience. My name is Edward Weissinger. I am the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the Baltimore City Council. We are here this evening to conduct a third of seven public hearings in the community on City Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning. Today's hearing will address liquor store non-conformities, uh, Title 18, Subtitle 7, mandatory termination of certain uses in Title 14 use standards, 14-335 retail goods establishments with liquor sales and 14336 taverns. This comprehensive zoning code rewrite is a very important time to learn about the general public's land use and zoning priorities. We want to hear from as many of our constituents as possible. The Tawanda Community Center has graciously allowed us to use this facility to, to conduct today's hearing. However, we must vacate the facilities by 9 a.m. We must leave by 9, p 9 p.m. 9 p.m. With all the noise, I was checking to see if you were listening. That was a test, okay. We would like to thank Ms. Odessa Neal and the Tawanda Community Center for hosting us this evening. Every hearing is open to public testimony and citizens may come and provide testimony at each public hearing. The following guidelines, however, will be enforced today and throughout the process. Persons wishing to offer all testimony must sign in and state their name, their address, or community in which they reside and who they represent for the record. Individual offering testimony will be limited to two minute time period. The screen behind me will assist you with keeping track of your time. If multiple people from an organization or affiliated group are present, one representative should be designated to speak on behalf of that organization or group. Individuals may not sign in to testify and then yield their time to another person. As stated previously, all ind individuals will be permitted to testify only once. If the individual has points they wish to raise that cannot be addressed in the allowed time, two-minute time period, they can submit written testimony to the committee staff at the hearing. If you would like to attend a hearing to testify about a part of the zoning code ordinance other than the section the committee intends to study during this hearing, you may do so and your testimony will be taken during the hearing. If if you wish to provide written testimony, please mail it to your Office of Council Services Attention to Antoine Banks, located at 100 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202. Um, the address is up on the, on the wall. Uh, the ground rules is, is I asked that if you could please put away your iPhones or your cell phones to give courtesy and respect to those who are going to testify. Um, the Baltimore, uh, the city, the city, after my introductions, the Baltimore City agencies will provide us with a report, which includes a PowerPoint presentation. During that presentation, there will be no questions asked during the presentation. Let them give their presentation. Immediately after the agencies give their presentations, give their reports, um, we will have two panels. One panel will be the Park Heights Renaissance and CPHA, and the other panel will be uh, the uh, K Grove Group. Uh, we'll give, they have 20 minutes also, and there will be no questions in regards to them. Immediately after the presentation, all council members and attendants can ask two questions. After each member has asked a question, council members may ask a follow-up question. Um, okay, do I get, oh, I think we just one. No, okay. We have with us, we have with us today up at the table, 
to my far right gentleman, um, Mr. Brand, Councilman Brandon Scott. To his left is Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. Thank you. To her immediate left is Councilwoman Sharon Gray Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to my immediate right is the Vice Chair of the Committee, Councilman Jim Kraft. We are also uh, joined by, uh, in the audience, Angela Gibson, who's here representing Mayor Stephanie Lawrence Blake. It's in the back. Um, uh, also, uh, from uh, President Jack Young's office. Uh, pre the president couldn't be here tonight. He had a private commitment, but he's well represented by his staff, Michelle Wurstberger, Chair of Kunst, and also an, uh, an intern, uh, Aaron Rao Rowe, is here today, tonight. Um, we also, uh, to my left, is my staff person, uh, Mr. Antoine Banks, and also uh, the Director of Councilmatic Services in the back, Mr. Larry Green, who is joined by his staff, uh, Brenda Williams and Richard Crummage in the back. Thank you. Um, at this time, before we begin, um, I want to uh, acknowledge and ask if she wants to say a few words. This is her district, and she has some concerns. Um, Councilwoman Sharon Green Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, first of all, I also would like to thank um, the uh, Park Heights Renaissance, uh, the, I guess, the leaders of this uh, revitalized uh, community, Tawanda Community Center. Um, the residents here are, are very proud of, of this community center and the, and the reopening of it, and um, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about community engagement, and this particular night is a clear example of community engagement. Um, we have been doing um, lots of hearings, and we'll have, continue to have some more throughout different communities on different topics. This is a this particular topic is very dear and true to me because of the um, mass liquor stores with within a mile radius within the Park Heights area. And everyone knows that Park Heights is going and continue to go through a major revitalization. And it's important, again, to have communication, community engagement, work with businesses, work with residents. And um, I, I thank all of you that are attending tonight and we are definitely going to be listening to everything that you say and um, it's again it's all about making the quality of life to um, better for the people in Baltimore and having everyone engaged so um, and I do want to say this is the third um, outside hearing we've had in communities and this has been the largest attended so far. So, so I am, this shows that this particular segment and issue is an important issue in this revitalization manual that we're doing. So um, I'm looking forward to the testimony. And again, thank you again, um, Park Heights Renaissance, for bringing back this community center for this community. Uh, anyone who wishes to testify in the rear with a basketball court is to my, the basketball net is to my right. Um, you have two or three people back there that will take the, uh, has the sign-in sheets. At this time, um, we will have uh, the health department, Dr. Barbo. Yeah, where's the, where's the microphone? I'm used to doing that. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Council President, or excuse me, not Council President, Chairman Reisinger, uh, Vice Chair Kraft, and members of the Council. I appreciate the opportunity to highlight the positive health impacts of Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore. The Health Department supports this bill because codifying measures to promote and protect the health of a city through its zoning code is an evidence-based approach endorsed by the World Health Organization, the U.S. Surgeon General, and the Centers for Disease Control. 
Furthermore, reducing alcohol outlet density is an evidence-based approach to community prevention that has been recommended by the Task Force on Community Preventive Services, an independent advisory board, expert advisory board, to the Centers for Disease Control. Tonight, I will focus my comments on alcohol outlet provisions. Independent public health research tells us that high concentrations of liquor stores are strongly and consistently associated with high rates of violent crime, murder, rape, aggravated assault. In the past four years alone, studies in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., New Orleans, Cincinnati, Houston, and Philadelphia have all demonstrated that the presence of packaged goods stores in communities is a predictor of violent crime and that the addition of even one package store increases rates of violence. Using 2006 to 2010 crime data, researchers from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health found that for every one additional alcohol outlet per census tract in Baltimore City, there was a 2.2% increase in the count of violent crimes after taking into account neighborhood factors such as rates of poverty, percentage of building occupancy, and drug arrest. So said differently, if you take two communities that are otherwise exactly the same, and one has an alcohol outlet and the other one doesn't, the one with will have a statistically higher, significantly higher rate of probability of having violent crime. Furthermore, in, the, in an article for the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, these researchers cite evidence from other jurisdictions that off-premise alcohol outlets can double the risk of violent crime and are specifically associated with increased homicide rates. According to liquor board regulations, Baltimore has more than twice the alcohol outlets than it should based on its population. And the burden of this oversupply is disproportionately concentrated in predominantly poor and African American neighborhoods. To get a comparable saturation of health promoting outlets, we would need 30 times as many grocery stores and four times as many parks or open spaces as we currently have. And so why is this important? This matters because Baltimore neighborhoods with higher alcohol outlet density are generally associated with shorter life expectancies, greater poverty, and higher homicide rates. Go ahead, Ms. Barbo. That's Thank you. Dr. Barbo. This matters because during our neighborhood health initiative, meetings that we held in communities, we heard loud and clear from residents in each of your council districts that the violence and poor health outcomes endured every day in communities with too many liquor stores is simply unacceptable. Most importantly of all, this matters because community members also said this is not a new problem and that they didn't need to hear yet another lecture or read another study about the reality of life in their neighborhoods. They just need us to act. We agree with them. That's why we support the three components related to alcohol outlets in the proposed code, including one, phasing out non-conforming class A liquor outlets and requiring that these stores transition to a different retail model, relocate to where liquor sales are permitted, or stop selling liquor. Number two, clarifying the definition of tavern licenses so that if one has a license to run a tavern, one indeed is running a tavern and not a de facto off premise packaged goods store. And finally, that limiting new liquor stores so that they cannot open with three, within 300 feet of existing stores, with the exception of downtown. Violence as a public health issue is something that I am passionate about. 
It is a complex problem that, I'm, that must be addressed using every tool available to us as public service officials. Let me emphasize that these provisions have nothing to do with consumption. Alcohol is legal and consumption in moderation may have health benefits. This has everything to do with the inequities allowed to continue because of outdated zoning code. This is not about picking winners and losers. It's about ensuring that everybody plays by the same rules and that we keep our residents safe. Since I last testified on April 3rd of this year, 21 people have been killed and 39 people have been shot within 300 feet of a Class A liquor outlet. Since that same time period, there have been 20 homicides and 32 non-fatal shootings in front of BD7 tavern establishments. During Planning Commission testimony earlier this year, one community leader asked a very simple question. What kind of Baltimore do we want to be? What kind of a legacy do we want to leave for the young people who live and work and learn in our communities? I say that we want to be the kind of Baltimore where every resident has the same opportunity at reaching their full health potential. A Baltimore that is intentional about righting wrongs, reducing disparities, and protecting the public today. We can't afford to kick the can down the road another 40 years, allowing countless more citizens to die needlessly because of our inaction. I applaud and fully support the planning department's efforts to modernize the zoning code so that it continues to promote and protect the health of our citizens. The studies are clear, the homicide numbers don't lie. It's up to us to act decisively in the best interest of the people who live in our city day in and day out. I urge City Council to support community health, well-being, and equity as presented in this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bova. Before the planning starts, I just want to acknowledge and introduce, we have Barbara Robertson, uh, House of Delegates in the 40th District. Welcome. Okay, planning department. Okay, good evening. We'll attempt to do this from a distance here. I'm not as good as it. Okay. Uh, good evening. Briefly, to explain, as I have at the other hearings, uh, the purpose of zoning, it is to put the rules and regulations on the use of land and the type of structures that can be built. Zoning dates back to 1923 in Baltimore and most recently 1971. Uh, zoning is um, just go to the, next one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the purpose of zoning is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens, and it's meant to create a level playing field so that property owners in districts are all following the same set of rules. The purpose comes to us from the state land use articles. Um, as far as the alcohol outlet density re uh, reduction strategy, it is in three parts. The first part is with liquor stores, and the second, taverns, and the third, liquor store distances. So with the next slide, I will go through each one. Um, there are approximately, under the new zoning code, 105, 100, it's actually 100 to 105 liquor stores located in residentially zoned property. And um, just a minute on the numbers because there's been some confusion and different versions and the data is based on liquor licenses at a point in time and non-conforming is defined as in a residential or office residential zone, but the language in section, uh, in Title 18, 
701 is only applied to the residential zones, so that is give or take 100 licenses or 100 businesses. And the text as written requires that these stores stop selling alcohol within two years of the effective date of this ordinance. Title 18 is the nonconformities title, and that's where those provisions rest. There are additional provisions there for new businesses or newly invested in businesses that they may apply to the zoning board for an additional two years. Stores would not be required to close as stores, but they would no longer be able to be alcohol outlets or sell alcohol there. They could sell other retail goods. Next one. And this map, I'm sure it's hard to read on the screen. There is a paper copy in the back. Uh, shows in red are the non-conforming businesses. The green are the conforming businesses. The next provision, also this is in Title 14 about liquor stores, says that there's a 300-foot distance requirement for a new liquor store to open 300 feet from an existing store, and that the exemption there is for downtown. The provision regarding taverns is also Title 14, 336, which are the use standards for taverns. Huh? The current code simply uses the word primarily to define a tavern as primarily for on-premise consumption under this city council bill, in addition to the definition primarily, there are use standards that require 50% of the sales and 50% of the floor area be dedicated to on-site or on-premise consumption. And there was, I would like to present to the um, council a, a, an amendment that was passed by the Planning Commission regarding this. The Planning Commission suggested that conforming taverns, that is taverns that are in our commercial areas, be treated differently as far as these rules than the non-conforming taverns. The Planning Commission concurred on the 50% rule, but believed that the, recommended that the conforming taverns have up to four years to conform with the 50%, with the non-conforming keeping the two years. So that is the one amendment in regards to these titles that was presented to the, by, or voted on by the Planning Commission. Okay, uh, council, questions from the council. We have Councilman Kraft. Yeah, Councilman Kraft and Middleton and Clark. Okay, um, Ms. Feinberg, let me just make sure that I understand. I have two charts from you. Um, the first one says non-conforming liquor stores? Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to talk about the first district. So right now, I just have three on there, right? Correct. Okay, and they're the three that you're talking about that would have to be closed within two years. Stop selling liquor within two years. Well, they don't sell anything. I mean, they sell potato chips, right? So, okay, I got that. All right, now, on the second thing about summary of BD7 and D licenses, there's a column here that says current zoning, proposed zoning, and then when it says proposed dash conforming, it's got a Y and an N. What does that mean? The yes means that it is conforming under the new zoning and the N means it is non-conforming. And who made that decision? It's based on the zoning. So in other words, the, the BD7 licenses that are in residential zones are non-conforming because they would be legally established businesses that would not be permitted under the zoning. As it is today, you cannot open a new tavern in a residential zone. There, we know that there are many taverns in residential zones, but they are non-conforming. 
for the most part, that is identical to today. Yeah, well, the, somebody, oh, there we go. Um, the thing that concerns me, looking at my, looking at this, and I have more than anybody, I mean, going through here, in terms of the BD7s, um, there's a good number of these places that are marked N, as in Nancy, that have been in the neighborhood for 30, 40, 50 years, and all of a sudden somebody's gonna come tell these people, some of which have been operated by the same families for those years, that they have two years that they've gotta comply with this. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that's gonna work on the BD7s. Um, I have one in here. I have one here in particular that's right down the street from my house that the community, people from the community purchased. I'm talking about BD7s, Mel. I'm not talking about the three liquor stores. I'm talking about bar restaurants, Bistro RX, right? Most of those would comply. That's not, that's an N one here. No, no, I, I'm sorry. And I, maybe it wasn't clear. Non-conforming simply means they are in residentially zoned properties. And it says they would be not impacted as long as 50% of their sales is for on-premise consumption. 50% of their sales and 50% of, of their, their area. Of their floor area has to be dedicated for on-site consumption. Right, as opposed to packaged goods. Of the, Most of the BD7s in the first district already comply with that requirement. Right, I'm not putting these guys out of business that have been in business, family businesses for generations. Let's, let's, if I, if I may have your attention, let's be civil and give these people the, the courtesy and respect to give the testimony. The same respect and courtesy we give you. Um, before I go any further, we have Councilwoman Vicki Spector had joined us Councilman Warren Branch, Councilman Bill Henry, um, and the next question will come from um, Councilwoman Middleton and then Councilwoman Clark. Okay. Councilwoman Clark. I just said Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and just to kind of, um, I, I was looking over uh, both sheets and noticed that, and, and remember keeping in mind that um, the Park Heights area has the most within a radius within the state, a lot of BD7s. I, I noticed that there's only six on the list in residential areas, and there is clearly more than six liquor stores in the residential areas of Park Heights. Again, it's based on the underlying zoning of the property, not, it, it may be a residential area or mixed area that has commercial. Um, if there are particular addresses that would, you would like us to double check, we can do that. And the same with the conforming taverns as well. So you, we definitely need to go over the addresses for both of those. Certainly. Councilwoman uh, Clark. Look at that. Councilwoman Clark. I have a couple questions um, about, I have two questions. So who's going to enforce these provisions? Because basically, I mean, just to let you know, and I think you already know, in my district, as far as the non-conforming uses, if I have a community organization that wants to sustain keep that alive and going, and they put that in writing to me, then I'm going to rezone it C, commercial. If they don't, I'll 
the rest will be where, where the wind blows. I, I have, so I'm not like speaking as an opponent, but I am speaking as a person who needs to call people all the time and say, go enforce this rule right away, okay. please. Um, I'll, and and when, so okay. basically, the lick, these are liquor licenses. Now, what, has the liquor board enforced the law? Probably not the way it should. Certainly, I can point out places in my district that need a lot of more attention than they get. But they are liquor licenses, and then this is a how, land use okay. document. So what, how, who's going to do this? I, I, that's a, a very important question, and I should have addressed that earlier. Um, this is, as you know, a zoning code. That is the land use regulations. Right. It does not speak to the license or the who. The license enforcement or violation of any license rules is by the liquor board, and there is no proposal to change it. So in the case of... This is saying, in the case of the liquor stores, if you are non-conforming, you have two years to stop your land use. You can take your license and move it somewhere else. You could sell it. So in other words, it's not, a, it's not speaking to the license. It's simply speaking to the land use, because that's all that the city rules can speak to. The liquor board can speak to the license or the quality of the operation. And on that enforcement, this is, again, the zoning code. So the enforcement tool is zoning enforcement. And we have someone from that group to speak, I think, towards the end of the city agencies in terms of the enforcement. So maybe we should defer to Jason. I just want to get it out there because... You cannot, from the housing department, terminate the license. Right. So Correct. what are you going to do? Terminate the use and occupancy? Correct. And Jason so, will speak to that. So that's what you're planning to do? Yes. And then my second question is this. It was only recently that I heard about the Category 2, and I don't understand it. Category 2 creates a nonconformity in the same law in which it, it uses that nonconformity to phase out a liquor establishment. So if I've got a packaged goods store and I'm zone B2 right now, some number of stores like mine, and I don't have one, thank goodness, Someone of a store like the one I'm imagining, I got the right zoning today. But it's being proposed by, I guess, planning that my store become zoned residential and that because it is now a non conforming use in the same bill, that it becomes phased out in two years. So it's like a double thing. What's that about? Um, as I think the council recalls from the earlier hearings, in developing this city council bill and the maps, we reviewed all the properties throughout the city for their pro proper zoning for that property and area, regardless of whether it had the store in it or not. And there were five, and they're indicated on your list in a, a gray shading on the A list. There were five that currently have commercial zoning. And separate from the issue of liquor, the planners reviewed the area and recommended that they be residentially zoned because of the, the character of the area in which they sit. Therefore, those five also would be subject to, as the bill is written today, would be subject to the same amortization. There are five of them. I'm not sure how well they copied in the, the graying out in your, in your Xeroxes, okay. we'll but right. we'd be glad to uh, get that more clearly to you. Yeah, it seems like, I don't know, double jeopardy or something. 
Okay. Okay. Yep, yep. Ready? Okay. Um, I got mine too. Uh, we're also joined by Delegate Sean Turant from the 40th District. Delegate. Yay! Stand up. Yay! And also, we are joined by uh, Andy Smallin, who's representing Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake. At this time, uh, Councilman Scott. Ms. Feinberg, uh, a comment followed up by a question. I guess for me, because looking at the list of the BD7 taverns in my district and having visited most, if not all of them, uh, they all have more than 50% of their floor space de dedicated to on-site consumption. And for me, uh, knowing that throughout the city of Baltimore, there are places that have BD7 licenses where no one has never seen the on-site consumption place. So my question to, to planning is, why haven't we thought about uh, making that 50% of sales and floor area more than 50%? Because if you're gonna be a tavern, you should be a tavern. Okay, okay. Uh, we it didn't occur to us, we didn't, weren't reinventing the wheel. We were clarifying the existing language that says primarily, and in working with law and health, primarily seemed to mean 50% or more, so we used 50%. That's... Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Catherine, just remember that we won't have work sessions, so nothing's, you know, carved in stone. Um, thank you. At this time, uh, uh, the law department, Mr. Nielsen, you want to change this now? Or? You want to do it? You want to wait till he can do it there? You already did it? Okay. Go ahead. Chairman Reiser, Vice Chair Kraft, members of the council, George Nielsen, city solicitor on behalf of the law department. I'm going to confine my remarks uh, tonight to the um, to the liquor stores, the A licenses. I'm happy to answer questions about BD7 or the distance, but I'm going to focus on the A licenses. So when um, the issues uh, that were eloquently summarized by Dr. Barbeau tonight were brought to the attention of uh, the group that was working on a draft zoning code, uh, we, we in the law department were asked, given the proliferation and the high density of liquor outlets in the city, were there lawful ways that we could address that problem in adopting our first new zoning code in 40 years? And we um, looked at a number of alternatives. We discussed with the group uh, a number of those alternatives, including the three that are before us tonight. Um, and, and in doing so, we looked at extensive case law in Maryland and throughout the country dealing with what's called the amortization process. And that is where you have a, a land use that has been non-conforming for many years, as in the case of the liquor stores or A licenses, or even a land use that is newly non-conforming, as is true of some of the BD7 licenses. Um, is there a way to um, bring those uses to an end that's lawful and reasonable. And, that, and the way that's been identified is amortization. And this council has used amortization on a number of occasions. The, probably the most hard fought and recent amortization um, use was in the sign ordinance. And that was a five year amortization period, heavily lobbied and contested. Um, but the council, for example, in the past has um, adopted three year amortization periods for check cashing facilities, 18 months for massage salons, 18 months for after hours establishments, and 18 months for tire storage facilities. So in, in looking at what the council has done before and what the Maryland cases tell us is the determining factor about the reasonableness of these amortization periods, we recommended the 
several tiered approach that you see in the bill for the A licenses. I would point out, I say several tiered because um, we, we should all remember that this proposal, while obviously not adopted at the time and not adopted even as we speak, but, but was first put forward in the summer of 2012. It is unlikely that the zoning code will be adopted by the council until sometime in 2014, best case scenario, but that would be a reasonable expectation. And the holders of these A licenses, which are not required to go out of business, but they are required to cease selling liquor, have at least two years from that date. So they have, they will have a total of four years from the time the proposal was first put forward until it impacts them specifically. And there is a hardship exception, as was mentioned earlier, for the owner of an establishment who recently bought the establishment on not knowing uh, of these requirements or who recently invested a lot of money not knowing of these requirements. And so what the courts tell us is you, it's a complicated balancing act as to what kind of amortization period is defensible in a lawsuit and will be considered reasonable. You look at the nature of the business. You look at, and this is particularly relevant in the case of the longtime um, A license holders, the length of time that they have been able to operate notwithstanding the fact that they were a non-conforming use. And that's relevant because to take the example of the A7 licenses from 1971 on, no new competitive licenses could enter those neighborhoods and locate in those residential properties. So they didn't have a monopoly, but those 105 licenses were able to continue to sell liquor and other, and other goods at those outlets free of the competition of additional licensees coming into the neighborhood. And in the analysis of the courts, that's a benefit that you get way in the equation when you decide um, whether the government's action in establishing a, an amortization period structure is reasonable. Something else I would point out as you consider, and you inevitably will, people will argue, well, there should be a longer amortization period. Why only two years plus two for hardships? Why not four or five? And you have to consider when you hear those suggestions or proposals, um, the negative implications on the community of having a use that um, is, is already got a finite end game. It's, you know, it's winding down. It's not likely to invest in improvements of the property. Um, it, it's going to be a different kind of user than it is now or was 10 years ago. So the longer you stretch out the amortization period, you do create some additional negative impacts on the community. I want to talk a little bit because this question has come up before in previous proceedings and it's important to consider this. So the opponents of the, particularly of the A license uh, provision say, well, we will litigate um, that issue if you adopt it in anything remotely resembling its current form and that litigation will bring the zoning code down. Uh, it won't. The zoning code has one of the most explicit, clear um, severability clauses of any legislation I've ever seen. And if a lawsuit is brought by an individual A7 license holder or a group of them, the rest of the code will go forward, become law, and will be un unaffected in every other respect by that litigation. Secondly, that litigation will almost surely be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. I have absolutely no doubt that generically, as written, the scheme of amortization is a reasonable one. I am sure that in particular instances with specific facts and specific circumstances, the holder of one of those licenses might make out a claim that as applied to him or her and their circumstances, it's unreasonable. That will not drag down the entire scheme for A7s or the scheme for the rest of the license holders, it, it would, um, if, if that property owner or license holder should prevail, will save that license at that property. 
So while there's always litigation, and while litigation is never pleasant, um, it is not the, the uh, terrifying um, dragon or the thing to fear. I, I really think the issue before the council, if you agree that um, there is an excessive density of liquor outlets in the city, as Dr. Barbeau, I thought, pretty convincingly laid out, then the question is, is this scheme of addressing that problem a reasonable one? Does it fairly balance the interest of the city in reducing those outlets, the community in many instances of reducing the outlets, and the property owners who admittedly have uh, an important interest to be watched over here as well? Uh, I will be at your work sessions. If you want to get down and dirty on any of this, I'll be there. I'll answer questions. I'll answer questions about BD7s tonight, but not about the details of the maps that I leave to Lori Feinberg. But I'm open for questions, and thank you for um, letting me to appear before you. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Ricky Spector and Councilman Jim Craig. Attorney Nielsen, uh, we're talking about the scheme of amortization and license people that had put their life savings and made a big investment in a license that was granted by the state, by the city. Say it was, say it was a law license, say it was a lawyer's license, and you made a big investment in your education and you built a big office and you put a lot of money in your office, and then we said there's too many lawyers in Baltimore. There's too many, there's too many. We're gonna give you two more years to practice law. And maybe if you go to court, you can get another year. How can you not equate that same situation where the state granted the license, the people made the investment, and then you decide unilaterally that amortization well, works? The first place it should work for doctors and lawyers and everybody else. Well, the they get licenses from the state. We have too many lawyers. Go ask everybody else. I know. agree, and I'll address. I, I agree, Council Inspector, and I'll be addressing your concern in three years. I'm probably the wrong person to ask the hypothetical. Well, I get, I guess, I guess, I guess what really worries me is it feel, I feel so un-American taking well, something away from somebody who worked so hard and made that investment. And, and you know, if they were given the license, then we have to eat it. We have to eat it. They well, were given that license. Council and they Inspector. paid for it. And they keep paying for it. The, the outlets, the, the facilities that you're talking about, I mean, it's your job to balance the equities and the community benefits. These outlets, these facilities, the A7s, have been allowed to exist as non-conforming uses, located on, on residentially zoned property where nobody else was allowed to do it for 40 years. They, the, they, they, George, they, George, George, could you let the mic go because we think we're, we're getting uh, difficulty from you holding the mic. Okay. Right. Um, so they have had the benefit of that non-conforming use status for 40 years. Uh, what this says is that that does not have to last forever. It normally doesn't last forever and you can continue to operate okay. a modified business. Okay, but how do you do it without properly compensating these people? How do you do that? Inspector, the cases, if you, if the cases, the cases tell us that your council has done it in, in other cases, in other instances, in the ones I referred to, and the practice of non-conforming uses, amortizing out over periods of time like two, three, and four years well, I guess I'm is approved by the majority of the courts of America. So, right. you know, that, it's not, it doesn't mean it's automatically the wise thing to do. You have wisdom and legality to consider. I'm telling you that legally, we are doing what is done all over this country and what your predecessors on the council have done in at least the half a dozen instances that I cited to. Uh, by, Ms. By, by the way, Mr. let me just, I wanted to just add something, because this is a BD7 observation, and, and I know I said I wasn't going to address that. I think that the zoning code provisions for BD7 says if you are a newly non-conforming 
BD7 license holder, you get three years, not two. If you're, if you're made non-conforming by a change in the zoning status of your property in this code, you get an additional year. I think it, the proposed amendment, I think, is for... For, for a, an extra year. I'm sorry, maybe you get more time. But, sorry. but um, I have more BD7s than anybody. But, but most of yours, as I think I heard, are compliant with the current requirements and the current and the, and the proposed requirements for well, what you have to be to be yeah. a tavern. And I'm not going to debate all those addresses and right. everything else and, and all the other stuff that you're saying about the BD7s. I have more bars than anybody, and we don't have a complaint about have a lot of about having a lot of bars and restaurants. We have a complaint about problem bars and restaurants, right. but. Anybody that comes to Southeast Baltimore, they come because of the bars and restaurants from all over, not just here, but all over everywhere, all over the country, all over the world to come there. So that's a separate issue. What I need to know, Mr. Nilsson, and maybe I missed it, maybe I missed it, is this. Under what authority do we as a council, um, can, can we as a council interfere with alcohol and uh, with liquor licenses. I mean, no. the people already have a liquor license, which is granted to them by the state. But they have to, they have to use that license. The holder of that license has to use it in a location that is compliant with our zoning code. So there are two entities that regulate the activity of that business. The liquor license regulates the nitty-gritty, for the most part, of who they sell to, how many days a week, what are the hours of sale. We, you, the council and the city, clearly have the authority to establish a zoning code and say which properties and which parts of the city those licenses can continue to I, function. I understand that. I understand that. Um, and I understand that on the front end. I understand that when... People are coming like um, and asking for something they don't already have already. For example, the conditional uses for live entertainment. When they come in and they say, I want live entertainment, and we say the, the, in order to get live entertainment, you, it's a conditional use, you have to make the following things or whatever. But when they already have the zoning, we're that now zoning them out of existence. Well, we're, we're, we're zoning their liquor license away. Well, they, do we have the authority to do we that? We do, and there's a law department opinion that goes back about nine or ten months, and I can get it for you and send it to you, that addresses pretty directly, I think, the authority of the council to act on as a matter of zoning law and land use control and, 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 and promulgate and adopt provisions like those that are in this draft zoning code. And remember, in the case of the A7s, we're talking about non-conforming uses. So they are uses that are not, could not be established today I by anybody else in a residential zone. And in the case of the BD7s, essentially all we're doing is giving some specifics to the concept that to have a BD7 tavern license, you have to be primarily a tavern, i.e. on-premises consumption. So we're not... There's nothing revolutionary in the case of BD7s either. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, one other, one other question. And I don't know if you're the person to answer. Um, no, you're not the person to answer. I'll ask somebody else. Terrific. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Uh, this time, uh, from Housing Enforcement, Jason. Huh? Are you doing? I'm sorry. George, George, uh, Catherine Middleton has a question. Sorry, George. Uh. 
Good. Testing. Oh, okay. Um, I guess my question is uh, is quasi question comment. Uh, first of all, business businesses in a community work with community. They work with churches. They work with schools. They don't. Um, you know, stay closed in within themselves. They don't um, call themselves taverns when the, when it's clearly not a tavern. Well, and that, that's what this whole that's what this whole issue is. There's several taver so-called taverns in the city that are not taverns, particularly in, in, in my area. They're clearly not. That, I'm they are, they are faux taverns. They, they have a tavern license that they are only able to have by calling themselves a tavern, and yet they are not taverns. We know that. And, and, okay. That, that, I'm That's what this bill is aimed at, that kind of facility. So all this, again, is focusing back to that board, the liquor board, which definitely right. has to somehow, they have to be a part of this. Right. And have, you know, again, it's about engaging everyone. That would be that would be terrific, but as you know, that's not a Baltimore City agency controlled or managed at the present time. But there, but this is Baltimore City, yes. and and they're operating illegally. That's why they're not communicating. Uh, that's why they're not accountable, and they're not communicating with the neighborhoods, and been getting away with things that for years and years and years. I agree. If the liquor board had been doing its job, we would have a lot fewer BD7s to deal with in this ordinance. So I guess one of my statements is, as you go, th as we all go through this process and you work with these businesses individually, I, I think it's important that you you have their track record of history of serving the minors, and you know, before you decide to give. Um, uh, handouts. Well, I, I'm not in the business of giving handouts. <laughs> uh, and Ca Councilman Kraft, by the way, I have the letter I referred to. It actually it wasn't a law department letter. We went to the uh, Attorney General's office on the, because they represented the liquor boards and said, does your regulation of the liquor board preempt us from acting as a zoning matter in the, in the way we're now doing? And I'll give you the copy of the letter okay. on the way back. Well, yeah, would you present that? To the, to the to the committee. Yeah, I'll give it to both of you together. Okay, Mr. Nelson, uh, Councilman Grants, Councilman Grants. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Um, I notice our police department liquor inspectors. Concerned about the establishments that's not uh, that's not complying with the law. So when I noticed that our police department and our liquor inspectors spends uh, a lot of money targeting underage uh, drinking or purchasing of uh, people under the age of 21 going in and purchasing alcohol, how come when they go into those same facilities they don't check on to see whether they're complying with the state law? with being able to allow folk to go in the back of those establishments. How come they talk just one and not the other? I would think that if you're working for the people, you're, you're, you're looking for anything that's wrong and not just targeting underage drinking. I mean, if I, back during the days during Bethlehem Steel, when those workers got off, they went to those bars so they can relax. Um, I can't see myself working to close down somebody who works so hard to build the establishment. I think they have a right to entail pass that business down to their heirs and so forth and so forth. But when I see taverns in the city of Baltimore, which our liquor inspectors are closing their eyes to and operating, to me, the enforcement part 
is just off the chart. But right now, I can take you to a couple of establishments in my district. And after the meeting that we had with CPHA at Fort Worthington, we took a liquor inspector over to the establishment on the Biddle Street and Milton Avenue. We asked someone to go in to see if they can go. The, the, the zoning ordinance piece from the city council, I think is the enforcement part from the state. If the state is required to regulate their license, I mean, we just got a 200 page report. How come the liquor board wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing? How come they're placing a responsibility like that on us? I mean, if you're saying that it's not based on whether it's a good operation or a bad operation, then how come we have our hands in the pot? Well, I'm, I'm, not I'm not sure what the question is, but I'll try to answer it as best I understand it. What the question, so, let me help you with the question again. Good, that'd be helpful. We can send police officers with underage cadets into a bar to see if they would purchase liquor. Correct. But while they're in there, they're not checking to see if those facilities are operating as taverns. Well... I mean, they're, they're both regulated by the liquor board. So, it sounds like a statement to me, and I'm going to ever just assume for a moment that it's accurate. It's not, of course, the... the how come we don't send them... How come we don't... How, don't, how come we don't send those underage cadets into the back to see if they can be served liquor at the counter? I, I don't know, in fact, what we do as, a, as an ordinary practice. I do know that the police officers do not have the authority to shut down bars by themselves because they think the bars are not complying with liquor board regulations. And I, am, I suspect that sometimes the cadets, the underage cadets that you're talking about, go in there for one specific purpose and don't make other observations. That may be true. But the reason I say I'm not sure what the question is is because having heard that and accepted that is true, it doesn't mean that we, that, I'm sorry, that we, that the council is unable to take whatever action it deems appropriate on, on land use matters under the zoning code. So to say they're not doing a perfect job doesn't mean that, we, that the council shouldn't be acting in the area. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Are you granting okay. thank, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Now we will go on to uh, the housing department, Mr. Jason Hessler. Nielsen. Good evening. My name is Jason Hessler. I'm uh, with I'm an assistant commissioner of litigation in the Department of Housing, Community Development, the Permits and Code Enforcement Division. I'll be very brief. I was asked to speak in regards to enforcement. Um, and the, the couple of questions I had were, how would the zoning code be enforced in relation to the taverns um, and liquor stores? And so at, at the point when this goes into effect and the use is no longer legal, then, and litigation is ended, enforcement would step in. Um, the zoning code provides for, uh, or requires rather, a notice, requires a notice of violation to be sent by the zoning administrator so that would go out be posted at the property be sent to the responsible parties and then enforcement could follow if that notice was not complied with and that enforcement could be civil citations administrative citations uh, civil injunctions in the district court in the state of maryland baltimore city or criminal prosecution um, in the past for situations similar to this uh, generally, it is administrative citation after the notice is issued, citation. followed up if the violation continues by civil injunction uh, to have the court order the use ceased and the operation of uh, the illegal operation shut down. Obviously, if they're doing other business that's legal, they could continue that. Um, and then the enforcement would go through the zoning administrator's office and ultimately through my office as far as uh, enforcement in court. 
So those are my, my remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councillor Trayer. Jason, with all due respect to your office, and we, we, talk, we call the zoning administrator, if not every day, every other day, either a call or an email with regard to zoning violations, and they can't keep up with what they have now. They don't have enough staff. They don't go out after 4.30 unless you can work out some really special deal to get them out. Um, as you, you, I think you're aware, I've been trying to just get them to take care of a place to put motorcycles on their sidewalk for a year. To put them in charge of this without giving them a substantial budget and substantial additional staff is extremely misleading to every single person in this room because while I certainly understand how well intentioned this entire exercise is, if you can't enforce it, it doesn't mean anything. And we already have a zoning code in effect that we can't enforce. It's everything that you guys can do to do code enforcement of the housing code, um, how do you propose to do this with the staff that you have? Uh, well, we are looking several years down the road, so it, it will be a challenge to address it, and it'll be a challenge that we need to you know, tackle. Okay, Mary Pat. Councilwoman Clark. Mr. Hessler. You and yours are all we have when it comes to code enforcement. You know it's true. We know it's true. Now, it's 2016, and I pick up the phone and call you, and I say, ABC um, is, um, is a, is a, Tavern, no, ABC is a package goods store in my district, and the neighbors all are all calling me up because their two years was up yesterday. And now I need you to do something. What can you do, Mr. Hessler? I will throw on my cape and jump out the door. <laughs> um. <laughs> And that's, yes, and that's why we love you, because you are truthful. You answer your calls, you answer your emails, you work with good people, you do a good job, and you're not going to tell us you can do something you can't do. I know we're limited. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jason. You, you got a question? Jason, Councilwoman Inspector. Jason, ditto everything my colleagues said. We are grateful to have you. When is it or why is it or how is it that you can call on those people that are paid to work for the liquor board to be partners with you in either complaint generated or enforcement? Every year, you have to get your license renewed. You can, the community and we could build a case on an on a, on a, on 11 month basis and go before that liquor board and say these people are a menace to the neighborhood. They are violating every law that we have. They are not respecting the neighborhood. They're doing all these bad things. You, I mean, why isn't, why aren't they the partners with us, the council people and you in making these be well run legitimate businesses? I wish I knew what the answer. Would what would it take is my question. I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. If, if it was changed, then... I like the old governor. <laughs> I like the old governor. 
If there was more enforcement in the liquor board side, there would be less for us to do and less angles for us to need to take in order to uh, go after the, the real trouble spots that are in the city. Um, it's true. Enforcement on the liquor side, and I think the 200-page report that Councilman Branch referred to um, well, lays it all out. I, I'm going to ask the good chair of the Land Use Committee if he would invite representatives from the liquor board so that we can meet them and know them and they can hear what we have to say. Maybe we need to talk to them face to face. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we have uh, next is the police department, Mr. James Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Um, I come before you tonight on behalf of Commissioner Batts and the police department. Uh, we were very fortunate that the planning department included us in a number of the planning sessions and so we've had the opportunity to discuss with many of our residents what oftentimes is among the greatest priorities for our citizens our community leaders and our commanders is the liquor density issue and the in the outlet issue and the problems that are brought to bear dr barbeau outlined before the council a moment you know several moments ago um, some of the statistics surrounding violent crime. So I, I don't re-offer re those statistics, but it's important to talk about the quality of life and the quality of life crimes, the nuisance, the nuisance issues, the loitering issues, and a number of the associated problems that impact our communities. We're working very hard, and um, progress is sometimes slow, but it's, it, it needs to be measurable. And they're, the proposals before the council um, are reasonable. They are reasonable in that they try to, as best they can, take into consideration a number of these issues. National studies, but Baltimore's statistics, show the impact of the large density. And we, we are working together in, in, this, um, in the crime fight and in the overall crime fight. And our elected representatives from Annapolis that are here worked in conjunction with our council in this very district to limit the hours of uh, liquor stores and when they can open so that we can offer safe passages to our children that are going to school. So it is a complicated issue, but it's a necessary issue. Uh, the police department will work very closely in the work groups to help the council understand. We've heard our residents, we've heard our citizens, and we ask that you support this legislation. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Uh, at this at this time, if I could have everyone's attention, please. At this time, we will have the two panels. The first panel will be the community panel, which will be Julius Colin, uh, Cologne uh, from Park Heights Renaissance, also Mel Freeman and Mike Siddell from CPHA. Now, well, rem remember the, the gravel was 20 minutes for each panel. Right, exactly. It's not a well, we, we do have some people that want to testify. So, yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Julius Colon. I'm the president and CEO of Park Heights Renaissance. Thank you for uh, having your hearings here in Park Heights. Um, for sake of time, I'm going to be brief and let each of the uh, committee members present themselves and, and give their testimony. But I just want to uh, state a couple of things. One is we have to think about the next generation. Too often we think about today and we don't think about what's tomorrow going to come. In Park Heights, this generation that we need to save, because Park Heights being one of the highest rates of prisoner reentry, one of the highest rates of HIV, has a lot of issues. And it's going under a community revitalization program. It is your responsibility as council members to correct the errors that were made by the state liquor authority. You have that opportunity now. You have that opportunity now. I understand the perspective that business 
and so forth, all that business argument. But we want people to move to Park Heights. We want residents to come back to Park Heights. They've been moving out because of the problems that we have with the liquor establishments here in this community. The loitering, the violence that exists around the liquor establishments, that our kids go ahead and go into these liquor stores, and it's almost like being condoned that liquor is okay. Look, they gotta find a new business. At the end of the day, they gotta find a new business. We as a community and a city, as a city, has to recognize that, we have to recognize that the problems do exist and we can't ignore it. So with that said, I'd like to turn over to uh, my panel. Uh, Mel Freeman will start with his presentation. Good evening, Council. <clears throat> Good evening, Council Members. My name is Mel Freeman. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens Planning and Housing Association, CPHA. For the last year, our organization has reached out to many of you, many of the citizens in this room, talking about how this law affects their neighborhoods and how this gives communities a tool to strengthen their communities. Many of these communities have been devastated by liquor outlets for over 40 years, and now we see this as just one tool that we can use to strengthen our communities. So at this point, I'd like to bring Mike Snydell on my staff, who will go through our quick PowerPoint presentation that we've shared with many of you to make sure that we're all on the same page. One of the key issues that's been brought up this evening is with regard to BD7. And all of the council members on this panel are on the same page. There's not as if Councilman Kraft is by himself. And I'm, I wanna be very clear. All of the council members want thriving BD7s in their communities that provide opportunities for folks to use the business. What we are disputing is there are BD7s in your districts that don't resemble a tavern in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Councilman Kraft, that is not the case in your district. Nearly every single BD7 in your district is conforming and having space for taverns, for people to come in and sit in the proper floor space for their goods. So I just want to make sure that you know your colleagues are with you there. BD7s just need to act like a business. And I'll bring up Michael here. Good evening, City Council. I'm hoping Mel is going to uh, take us through the presentation. But this is the presentation that we've been presenting to community associations since we've been working on this. And we have found overwhelming support for reducing alcohol outlet density from your constituency using this presentation here. So why does the number of alcohol outlets matter to us? And why does it matter to your residents? If we look at a healthy number, as we were told, a healthy number of liquor licenses in our community given by our own Baltimore Liquor License Board, given by the CDC and other indicators, that would be for every one license we'd have about a thousand people. Right now, that would mean we would have about 625 active licenses in the city of Baltimore. In reality, we have over 1,300 licenses. So why else is this a problem? Well, as mentioned by the health department, the Baltimore neighborhoods with higher alcohol outlet density have poorer health, greater poverty, shorter life expectancy, and the more recent research, we already know this anecdotally, shows us that where there's more alcohol outlets, there's also rates of violent crime that are higher. Why else does this matter? And I'm gonna show you on a map and direct you towards this presentation. If we look at where these alcohol stores are located, they are located predominantly in African-American and low-income communities. And this, and this also matters for Baltimore City public school children. If we look at our children, Children that live near liquor stores are more likely to see people selling drugs. And I think the most compelling statistic, City Council, is if we drew a quarter mile radius, the normal radius we use to walk to a neighborhood amenity, we would find that more than 50% of Baltimore City public school children have a liquor home within a quarter mile of their home. If we did the same thing for a grocery store, something everyone in this room wants in their community, that number goes down to 13%. It gives you a sense of the density of alcohol in our community. 
And while it may be somewhat unique to Baltimore, the high number of alcohol stores, what's not unique to Baltimore is we can look across the country. When the number of alcohol stores goes up, violent crime goes up. When the number of alcohol stores goes down, violent crime goes down. It doesn't go away, it goes down. Next slide, please. And again, it's been 40 years since our last zoning code. We see this as a once in 40 year opportunity to reduce density. Next slide. And we wanna make it clear, we understand that the Baltimore Liquor License Board doesn't do its job. It is a failed agency and everyone understands that, but we need both to regulate how our private land is used for alcohol and also to regulate the license. We are asking our city council to give us both mechanisms of enforcement. So the three steps of this process are very easy for CPHA to agree with. The first is reduce these class A establishments. Go to the next slide. And if we, you can go to the next slide as well. And if we look at where these establishments, these non-conforming class A's, if you look at this map, look at where they're located in Baltimore City, they are located primarily in East and West Baltimore, the lower income and the African American communities. If I map these over medium home sales prices, these are medium home sales prices in our city, they map almost perfectly. Where we have more liquor stores on non-conforming streets, we have the lowest home sales in our city. We can go into individual districts. We can look at District 12, sorry, that's District 13 right there, and it maps well in individual districts as well. Or we can go one over, and, or we can do the same in the district and map it over food deserts, and we'll see the exact same thing. Or we can go one over, and we'll see that in District 12, we're seeing the exact same phenomenon. Or we can go across the city to Councilman Welch's district, and we'll see the exact same thing. But if we go down to one of the wealthier districts in Baltimore City, we have only three of these non-conforming districts. Look at where these non-conforming stores are located. We need to hear his testimony. Thank you. We, we ask you to look at where these stores are located. If we go into individual communities, that's Broadway East right there. I am showing you just the non-conforming stores in that community. I could add conforming stores to it. There are nine conforming, non-conforming stores in Broadway East alone. So part two, we agree with as well. As we know, in a lot of Baltimore City, we have a lot of taverns that are not acting like taverns. This legislation simply gives zoning enforcement the power to make them act as taverns with this 50-50 rule. And it, we can go to the next one. And we just want to make it clear, because there does seem to be some confusion about this. Taverns that act like taverns will not be affected by this legislation, and that's why we support it. Taverns that act like taverns will not be affected. We are simply asking taverns to act like taverns. And finally, the distance standards. Given the density you see in these maps, we do not need any more packaged goods stores locating next to packaged goods stores. We already have way too many to begin with. So I want to, we've also been speaking to all of you individually, and I tried to highlight some of the conversations we've had about your concerns with this piece of legislation. And the first is the Baltimore Liquor License Board is the problem. Let's deal with that. We agree with you. We need to fix the Baltimore Liquor License Board. But again, we need both. We are asking you to give the city some authority to regulate liquor via land use. The second one we've heard from some city council members is we should compensate packaged goods stores as we ask their non-conforming use to move. What we have heard again and again from residents who live next to these stores is who has compensated me for the last 40 years? Who has compensated the residents that have lived next to these stores? And I really want you to think about those maps and think about that. And the next concern we've heard is that this legislation is anti-business. And I'm glad that Park Heights Renaissance spoke to this already. CPHA and the communities that have all these liquor stores, what they'll tell you is liquor stores are anti-business. Nobody wants to come to a community that's saturated in liquor stores. Nobody wants to open a new needed microenterprise in neighborhoods that are saturated for liquor stores. And nobody wants to buy anything from another microenterprise in neighborhoods saturated with liquor stores. 
And the last concern we've heard is this legislation can't be enforced. So why should we pass it? We want to make it clear that our understanding is that unlike the failed BLLC, unlike the failed liquor board, this piece of legislation will actually give the city some enforcement with an effective agency. So we would like city council to have that enforcement because the BLLC does not do its job. We want both and that should lead to more effective enforcement. The bottom line is we have been going to community association, resident groups, community relations committees, and we have found overwhelming that citizens support this piece of legislation. And we are here today to tell city council that a vote to amend this portion of the legislation or a vote to suggest we should compensate liquor store owners in these communities is a vote against your constituency. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're still good with time, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Hi, I'm Deborah Verholden. I'm a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Much of the research that's been cited, I either led or was a, a part of myself and many of my colleagues at Hopkins um, take this issue very seriously. So I just want to let it be known that from a public health perspective, this makes sense. Um, zoning is a public health tool. It was designed as a public health tool. It's a great honor for me to see it being um, used this way. I won't touch on anything that's been said, but I will say as a researcher and as a scientist, I agree with, with pretty much what, what has been said by my panel, but I wanted to go from sort of the 30,000 public health view, which is what we, we've been doing so far, and take it down to the level of a resident. So one of the things that I've done is I have a system where we are all throughout the city on a block by block level, looking at neighborhood level indicators of quality of living um, issues that our residents face. We do things like we count up the number of drug vials and baggies and, and monitor for open air drug markets and, and people fighting in the street and potholes, a variety of indicators that, that tap into quality of life. We were out in the community a few months ago and there was a woman and I've asked her if I could use her name, she said no, so I'm gonna refer to her as Miss Smith. And I can tell you she lives very close to the corner of Tivoli and Harford Road. She has five liquor stores and four blocks of her house Huh? Oh, she has uh, five blocks and uh, five liquor stores and four blocks of her house. And she bought her house just about 52 years ago. She said, in her words, these four liquor stores have completely demeaned the value of my home. This is my legacy, this is my inheritance, and I now have nothing of value to give to my children. And it breaks my heart that there's no dialogue about her being compensated. There's no discussion of what that meant for her. It's not, for many of us, the opportunity to own a home and live in a safe and healthy, supportive community is something that we take for granted. And Councilman Kraft, while I appreciate your comments, I would urge you to do a ride-by. You have no BD7s that are actually gonna be impacted by this legislation. If you ride through East Baltimore, the quality of life for those people versus the quality of life for your constituency in Canton are not even comparable. I'll, I'll leave it, I'll leave it, I will leave it there and I will just say that the research community, the public health community at Johns Hopkins University is ready and willing to help provide the data, not to take a position, but if there are specific questions that you have from a public health perspective, I do encourage you to come to us because we'd like for you to be as informed as possible as you make these tough decisions. Thank you. Now we're gonna hear from a couple of residents. I was gonna introduce myself as just a resident of Park Heights. However, I am a resident of Park Heights. I'm a proud resident of Park Heights. Of I'm sorry, what was your name? My name is Mona Lisa Giallo. I, um, I gave up my car about four or five years ago, and I decided to one, run and walk everywhere I go, to work everywhere. And I decided to make an impact in my community by doing that, by being visible to the people in the community. And I'm very concerned about of some of the councilmen stating that this is anti-business, anti-business. Being a walker, being a runner in the Park Heights area, I try to purchase items from my area, but I can't.
because there aren't any. All I have are liquor stores or, or liquor stores or areas that I can purchase food that isn't good for me or for my family. And, and, and I urge you, please, to look at this legislation. Look at the impact that it does to a person like me that raised three children, that is a, a person that pays taxes, a person that believes in health and education with our people here. Please look at the legislation and think about that. Please, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Col Mr. Cologne, we're, Mr. Cologne, we're in. They got two more we're minutes each. We're past your time here. Yeah, we're past your time. Hey, family. I just want to know, how can you justify from Park Circle to Belvedere 10 liquor stores? How can you justify in the community? How can you justify those who have these liquor stores that do not live, who do not live, I got you. So how can you say, and businesses go out of business every day in this economy. So compensating them is not a good thing for my taxes that I pay as a citizen. So please do not make me feel that you want to take my money to compensate them for putting them out of business that affects the community that I've lived in for the last 40 years. I just find it very disrespectful to this community. So therefore, just remember my loved ones that in 2016 is election season. And because you don't do it today, just remember that everybody in this building will be seeing you at 2016. So remember that. Thank you. Final speaker, final speaker. What? Tough act to follow. Um, I live here in Baltimore most of my life. I uh, grew up in East Baltimore with two liquor stores on either end of the block. Um, I saw what those liquor stores did to my community when I went back after I became an adult with an education, also from Baltimore City Public Schools. I currently live in a community that has one BD7, and that BD7 has become the conversation, the issue, the concern of citizens, not only in Howard Park, but we've also called in the BUILD organization and Child First organizations to have listening campaigns to figure out, okay, what is the biggest concern in our community? Well, across the board, it was that corner. That's how it's described. What corner are you referring to? The one corner in our community that has a liquor store that is, of course, non-compliant based on new legislation, we are very, very, very concerned about the future of our uh, new renaissance with the development of a supermarket, et cetera, how that one place can impact the community. I sympathize and I feel very, very sad about the amount of liquor stores that we've seen within the Park Heights community alone. But the biggest issue is that there are discussions um, being considered for compensating these uh, non-compliant businesses for a loss of business. Well, the turn of the century, Coca-Cola was a very big drink, until they realized that cocaine had some negative impacts. Well, the change didn't affect the businesses as much as it did the community that were becoming impacted by these drinks. We're simply asking that the city council evolve to recognize the impact that this liquor has on the low-income communities in our city. We can look at the things that are being done. We can say that whether it's by accident or by design, the high density of these liquor stores in the low-income communities is something that needs to change. And the time to change that is now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We got a... At this time, uh... We'll call the, the business panel, uh, Lisa Harris Jones and Sean Malone, who are representing the Korean merchants. Sean, they had 30 minutes, so you're entitled 30 minutes. Uh, okay. Okay. I won't use 30. Just to be fair. Good. Yeah, thank you. Um, on behalf of the Baltimore Association of Liquor Stores, my name is Sean Malone of Harris Jones and Malone. 
John, you had to speak this, close, get closer to the microphone. Is that better? Does that work? Here? Okay. Yeah. On behalf of the Baltimore Association of Liquor Stores, my name is Sean Malone, Paris Jones and Malone. Before I begin, I want to thank the council for hard work. This has been a long summer for you guys. And we are across the state testifying in front of different legislative bodies at both the state and local level. And I'm here to tell the people in this room, no body, no legislative body works harder than the council dealing with very difficult issues. And, and I thank you for that, and I thank the state representatives who have come. In this room today, in this room today are people all of good intentions, and, and we're looking at a problem. Um, those who have been in and around Baltimore and working on problems in Baltimore understand that we don't make progress with Band-Aid solutions. We don't make progress with proposals that are good for a headline, but are not good for any tangible results. What the administration has brought to you is not the result and is not going to bring the hard work required to address the issues in our communities. Where I could... Go ahead. Let's, I'm asking the audience, let's give them the same consideration and respect as we gave the other panel, okay? I appreciate that, thank you. Oh, it was a baby, oh, I apologize, I thought so. Mr. I Chairman, thought someone was booing. I'm sorry, Sean. Sorry, it was, it no. was a baby. I'm it sorry. was just a baby. <laughs> um, the, the, what, the, what the administration has brought to you is a study. It's a study that doesn't have a broad, doesn't, doesn't claim any causation, and doesn't show any, cause, any causation of the impacted businesses that seeks to affect, that the solution has been brought. Mr. Nielsen testified that he was given a problem, and this is the best solution he could come forth with with regard to zoning. What he ignored was laws that are currently on the book that the police department and the police commissioner can enforce, nuisance laws, with the result of two complaints, the commissioner can shut down a problem business. Enforcement's not being done. I realize that's hard work, um, but it's not being done. The enforcement of the liquor board, as all acknowledge, is insufficient. That's hard work. It can be done, and it's a more precise approach. Interestingly enough, over the past week, we have witnessed a debate a public debate between the governor and, and the mayor of Baltimore. And the mayor of Baltimore, and rightfully so, has said she does not embrace a policy of mass arrest. And she has assured law-abiding citizens of this city that we will not engage in mass arrest. Why? Because we are not going to sweep the good up with the bad. We are not going to deny individualized due process to citizens in an attempt to solve a broader social goal. We are instead going to, we are instead going to engage in the hard work of targeted enforcement getting to the truly bad actors off the street. I would urge the administration to pay attention to what our good mayor has said, and I would urge the council, who is a check and a balance for this administration, to hear what she said and not apply a broad approach to this problem. If we concede that liquor establishments, there's too many in this city, the approach here is not to take away 5% of them, 6% of them, with showing no causation that they create a problem in the city. It does have real effects on these individuals, these families who invest in and work in the city. And one of the most painful things about this is, because of this legislation, my client's been made a scapegoat in the city's problems. We are not the cause of all that is wrong in this city. Okay, let's, let's calm down now. We're not the cause of all that is wrong in this city. What I would submit to you is this. I think there are good minds on both sides of this issue. I would ask, heeding the mayor's approach of targeted enforcement for, police, for the police in our communities, that we engage in targeted enforcement. Let's, we, let's calm down. Give him the courtesy respect. That we engage in targeted enforcement of the actual violators within our community. We bring these, these people forth. We remove their licenses. We shut their stores down. Then, and only then, will we truly be addressing the issues that so many of us are concerned about. But I assure you, a blanket solution, a blanket suggestion for a solution like this, it'll create a headline. It'll have no tangible effect except to harm business owners who've invested in, in, in this city. In conclusion. We can decrease the density of liquor stores with enforcement, and in doing so, we can help to address many of the problems that are being raised here tonight. 
I urge this council to use its check and balance on the executive. I urge them to, to say to the executive branch, listen, don't bring us a Band-Aid solution. Use your enforcement powers. You have 200 police officers on administrative duty. You have 200 vacancies in the police department. We have, the we have laws on the books to address problems in the community. That requires hard work. I urge us to tell the executive branch to do that hard work in the community addressing problems and not to hurt the hardworking people who have established businesses that are operating honestly. At the end of the day, this proposal, if one-third of, if if 20% of the, of, of, of the problem of stores in the city are a problem, you will be affecting less than 1% of the problem in the city. You will be leaving 94% of the stores open and the problems that they bring. Let's go after the bad actors. Let's not use a blanket approach to enforcement, the very approach that this mayor condemns publicly. Good evening, I'm Lisa Harris-Jones, and again, I'm here on behalf of the um, Baltimore Associations of Liquor Store Owners. My portion of the conversation, and I appreciate being in Park Heights. I was born in Park Heights. I was raised my early life on Park Heights Terrace. I've graduated from Northwestern High School. I understand this community. I understand the issues of the taverns. I've been representing clients on liquor board issues for years. It's been an overwhelming theme that there's taverns that aren't operating as taverns. I've been at the liquor board. I've watched the police come in several occasions on the issues that Councilman Branch actually pointed out. And um, unfortunately, I don't think he was asking a question that, that should have been misunderstood. The question was very clear. If you can send police in to enforce issues with respect to underage drinking, I've seen it. I've been at the liquor board. I've represented clients. Why, when the police officers are in there, and many times they're in there with the liquor board inspectors, why can't they figure out that that tavern's not open, and why can't they violate that, that, that business for an issue that, that's apparent? It's not hard. It, again, it goes with the theme of someone's got to do the work. So instead, the administration has decided, I'm going to take the easy way out because we've been working on this for a year. When we go in, we talk to agency heads, we talk to legislators, we've talked to everyone about this issue. They say to me, Lisa, I hear you. I know at the end of the day, there's 1,500 liquor licenses out there. There's a, there are bad actors out there. We have a problem with the, li the liquor board doing their job. We figured after 2006, when we started drafting the redraft of the zoning bill, to wait until 2012 to stick into the law that they're going to take away non-conforming licenses. In those years, while they were drafting that bill, they took the time to meet with, because I represent other clients, everyone's read the newspapers, they took the time to talk to other businesses to go visit their sites to see what they need to make it all work, but they never sat down and met with my client. They never, even during the last planning department meeting, they asked the question, have you visited these addresses? Have you talked to the liquor board address by address to find out if there's liquor board violations? The answer was an overwhelming no. No. Is that lazy? Maybe but it's inconsiderate and unfair to people that have invested money, bought businesses, was a part of a process for 40 years where liquor licenses non-conforming, transferred hands, the liquor board said okay, they got their use permit, no one said anything, they invested their time, their money, and they ran these businesses, and now you say I give you two years, and you figure it out. That's not fair. And this council is better than that. I have worked with you for 20 years. You are better than that. So I ask this council to do the hard work, to take the time, look at the addresses, and in many cases, some of you have said, I know some of these businesses. They're good in my community. I'm going to figure out a way to rezone them. Well, let's do something better than that. Let's look at the addresses and figure out a process 
That's not a sweeping way of taking, to try to get to 10 bad actors or 20 bad actors, putting 120 people out of business. Let's figure out a better way, if it's legislation, if it's figuring out how to get the police department and the liquor board to do their job better, let's do that as opposed to doing this easy way out of putting people out of business just to get to one or two percent of the bad actors. So I want to just give the opportunity. I think um, Bob DeShields, who has been working on this issue with us, wants to say a couple of things, but we do have some business owners. And we also have over a thousand people that have signed a petition, I'd like to give this to you, that have said, city council, you can do better than what's been presented to you. Chairman Reisinger, members of the council community. My name is Robert Fulton DeShield. They make me go last because I'm the old man in the office and I talk slow, but I'm going to make this kind of quick, I think. I, you, you will before long, just give me, be patient. It gets louder as it goes along. There is not, listen to me very carefully, there is not a liquor store in a single neighborhood where people don't buy liquor. Understand what I just said now? There is not a liquor store in a single community where people don't buy liquor. What am I saying? If the people didn't buy liquor, the liquor store wouldn't be there. Now, what, am I, what do I mean by that? What do, what, do, what, do, what do I mean by that? Mr. Nielsen, I'm going to explain it. I'm going to explain it. Because, you know, when I used to go in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, they said if you don't drink, you won't get drunk. If you don't buy it, nobody will sell it. Now, let me, let me, let me be more clear. Let me be more clear. Let me be more clear. Mr. Nielsen said... Sir, you need to talk to the panel. When you look this way or that way... We'll I, I'm sorry. You. I'm sorry. Talk to the microphone. I'm sorry. I apologize. Mr. Nielsen said that these businesses had no right to expect to remain there forever. He is exactly wrong. When the zoning code made these businesses non-conforming in 1971, it's because they were here before the code. If these businesses were so bad when they were here before the code in 1971, there, should, there would have been amortization tables enacted then, not 40 years later. Not 40 years later. The, they, were, they were told then that you're okay. They were told then that you could continue as long as you operated in accordance with applicable law, which they have done every year since then. And the ones that haven't have gone by the way. The ones that have not stood up to times of the economy, have, like every other business, have gone by the way. The ones that still exist are there because the community still support them. That's why they're still there. I'm saying this to you. Quite, quite respectfully, adopting this broad measure to deal with the problem stores that you have, and I agree that there are probably some problem stores, is a lot like shutting down the government because you don't like affordable health care. It's a lot like it. And it shouldn't be done. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Excuse me, excuse me. Let's give them some courtesy, please. How many times do I have to keep asking? Good evening, everybody. My name is Domingo Kim, and this is my wife's son. Can we have order, please? Okay. We have a business on Green Mountain Avenue. We have bought this business about six and a half years ago. This establishment has been open for around 70 years. Our bar has been history and memorable place for a long time, not just for our community, but also for Baltimore. Those elderly people in their 70s and 80s wake up early in the morning and they come to stadium lounge to have a bottle of soda and stay there for nine, 10 hours watching TVs. Neighbors come to the stadium lounge when they are off and to get the brunch, they, they come in and socialize with neighbors while they're having a meal. Retirees come to stadium lounge and meet other retirees. 
neighbor, neighbors come to stadium lounge and to meet their friends when they, are, when they get off their jobs. Baltimore Raven fans come to stadium lounge and have a drink, free food, and cheers Ravens with, with their friends. We have lots of people patronize the stadium lounge for many different reasons. Stadium lounge has been a good place for our community to socialize. Now, new re rezoning bill is trying to close down our establishment and our community people will lose the socializing place. We have more than 12 working people in stadium lounge. All of them are living in Baltimore City. All of them will lose their jobs. They will increase increase Baltimore City unemployment rates. This will lose lots of taxes for Baltimore City. It will make Baltimore worse than before. I and my wife have been working seven days a week for about 30 years in order to survive in this tough world. Since the economy is not so good, we expect to have uh, to move to the we moved to a uh, store on the second floor to survive. When stadium lounge closes, my wife and I have to face lots of problems. We will lose our lifetime savings. We have to file a bankruptcy. How would you feel if someone comes to your home and tell you that there is change with your city zoning and you have to move if you have to move out of your home within two years without any compensation for your property value, I'm pretty sure that you will, do very, you will be very upset and try to do anything you can in order to protect your lifetime savings. Did we do anything illegal? We are, we are serving people as they want. We are, com we are communicating with neighbors in order to make the city better. We clean neighbors on a regular basis. We are having parties with neighbors. We donate community in order to make the city better. We are working hard with the community. We are trying to do this. Why, why are you doing this to me, my wife, and my two kids? We are just hardworking US citizens, just like you are. Who will who calls United States as a democratic country? If this new rezoning bill passes with the liquor store related issues, United States should be should be called community, I mean communist country, not democratic country. Taking away my 30-year lifetime savings, my wife's lifetime savings, and my two sons' home is not democracy. I believe that this new rezoning bill is for people. I believe that this rezoning bill is for our community. Lots of people will lose the, their good place to socialize. Okay. Um, whatever I mentioned was just for now for one store. There will be hundreds of other stores. We have the similar issues. Even though our bar op operates seven days a week, there's no way our bar sales can be 50%. Uh, practical number is not 50, it's 20. Um, I strongly oppose these bill issues. And we have to find different way and better way to make the Baltimore better, not this way. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jay Chung. The store I represent is the Charles Village Schnapp Shop, located approximately two blocks from Johns Hopkins University campus. My family's owned the store for over 26 years. There's been a store in that same exact location for over 100 years. Now, when the planning department reviewed my appeal to be, to be taken off this list, they <coughs> They took a Google Street View picture, put that up, and said, clearly, a residential area. Appeal denied. They never called me. They never talked to me. They never came to my store. Now, the, the increase in crime stated by the planning department 
and uh, the report on the Transport Baltimore website was 2.2% in one report and 1.67% in another report. In other words, of all the crimes that happen in my neighborhood, I report, I call 911 and report the most number of crimes out of anyone. So that 2.2 or 1.67 percent does, doesn't even cover the crimes that occurred to me and my family in my business. The robberies, the shoplifting, I've had a gun pulled on my face, uh, a grandmother pulled a knife on me, a grenade was placed in front of my sister, my mother's been clobbered over the head with a gun, bottles of liquor, etc., etc. Now, now, what happens when you remove a, a, one of these quote-unquote bad stores from a neighborhood? Some, many of my customers came up to me and said, hey, that store over there, they're terrible. There's drug dealers out there. Uh, they have people begging for change. It's a ter terrible store. They should close that down. And I went, when I asked every one of them, what do you think happens to those people who are causing those problems? What do you think happens to them once that store closes down? Do they suddenly get jobs and, and become better citizens? No. They go to other stores. They'll hang out in front of laundromats, the McDonald's, uh, the corner store that doesn't sell alcohol. You know that's going to happen. We're just pushing the problem around. We're moving the dirt from one side to another. You know who's causing those problems. They live in your neighborhoods. You know, you know who's up to no good when they're standing outside of a store. And Sir, talk, talk to the panel between. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But anyway, they talk about liquor store density. I agree there's too many liquor stores and outlets in the city. And there should be a mechanism for getting rid of some of them, and it should be done in a fair and equitable manner through enforcement. Now, one thing that most people don't seem to understand is that currently, even in, even in some of these areas that have too many liquor stores, do people here realize that there are there are private citizens, unlicensed, who are selling 40-ounce beers, six-packs, out of the trunks of their cars, out of suitcases. And when you get rid of some of these legitimate, uh, licensed places, what do you think uh, that activity is going to do? Is it going to go down? No. There's going to be more of those vendors. Right now, you've got people selling... If you go to Lex Lexington Market, there are people selling bottles of Grey Goose and gin for cheaper than I can buy it from the distributor from. Why? Because they're stealing it from somewhere else and they're selling it there. You can go to liquor, uh, Lexington Market tomorrow and find these people. So if you get rid of these liquor outlets, it's not going to reduce liquor consumption one bit. Everyone here knows that. And the problems that, that stem from that is, is going to continue. You're going to get rid of people that you can currently work with or you're going to replace them with people who are going to be on the streets selling liquor and, and beer out of suitcases in the trunks of their cars who are going to be completely unregulated. I mean, I can take you to open-air crack markets right now. That's illegal. Now, one other thing. People seem to dismiss the light, hard work and the life savings that my family's put in. Our, our business was worth over half a million dollars before the announcement came out. After the announcement came out about this bill, it's worth zero dollars. You've taken away their life savings, their IRA, their pensions. Think if someone came to the city council and said, Baltimore City's out of money, you guys are out of luck on your pensions. That's exactly the same thing that's happening to us right now. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Hello, Council. How are you? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, in front of you. Uh, my name is Kwang Hee Choi. I have a business in uh, Park Heights last uh, uh, 28 years. I was a member of uh, Park Heights Community Association. I was a uh, Treasury Secretary under uh, Beverly Thames. She was a very, very uh, famous. She was a front runner uh, about 20 about 18 years ago, uh, reformed the liquor law. Um, I work with her. Well, maybe I, I'm the survivor. Well, yes, I am. I'm, I'm very respectful in my community, my neighborhood. Um, but on this, I don't dispute many what you, uh, you know, group talk about it. But I have a very 
difficult uh, to accept this is density, especially in regions or area. Um, the council are presenting a map, which is from Park Circle from the bottom to the Northern Parkway to 83 on the uh, east side and the, uh, the railroad, subway railroad on the west side, which is uh, like a Park High Renaissance area. I believe it, there are about more than 30,000 residents lives in their area. But you see how many liquor stores in there? There are only 25. So, I buy the theory of uh, one store for a thousand people. So, what is the density in here? Density, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Council uh, Crab. Density goes down to downtown. Yes, See? Two more minutes. Yes. I was involved with uh, the, the groups representing uh, store owners. Okay. Year of 2000, actual liquor license in Baltimore City is uh, 1600. Now it's a 13, about 1350. It's a decline. As you know, in regional area, there's no issuing new license. Most of the new license issuing over downtown area, tourist area, Fast Point, downtown, South Charles. Not in here. See, in this area, last 10 years, we lost three licenses. One for Mr. Arby. The bar is closed down because they, they cannot stand on. The other one is a, uh, the Jim Parkers, the famous uh, football player. He, he give it up. The other one is the, the bar over the ground works. So what I'm saying is let's give more No, not the money. I want, I want the um, more rules, you know, the city, state, everyone to work yeah. together. And plus, let us, you know, I mean, we, if, if you, I don't make money, I'm going out. We, I understand. Okay. We, I, this, is, so, this, is, this is going to be a long journey. We've right. we got more hearings, and we're going to, we have Thank to you work. very much to hear my uh, voice. Thank Dante, you. Thank you. At this time, we are ready to take on public testimony. Um, Mr. Robert, uh, I apologize if I, uh, Das, das Mio, Robert Das Mio? Das Mio or? Huh? Roger Shields. What about Wang He Cho? Was he on the? Yeah, okay. Domingo Kim, was he on the panel? Okay, okay, I just saw. Uh, Benjamin Jones? Good evening. I have been a resident of Park Heights area, homeowner for 38 years. Uh, we know uh, from liquor, it gives you kidney, liver, and heart disease. Uh, what my question is, have you contributed any money to the health that what these problems cause? Okay, and another thing, like I say, to understand these problems, you have to live in Park Heights and see these things. Like I say, uh, I've been right here for 38 years, and uh, to, uh, to contribute, to contribute money to help us solve some of these problems would be a great idea. And like I say, to stay in Park Heights and see these things daily, what it has caused to our young people to go astray. Six o'clock, the bar used to open. You got cigarettes and alcohol sitting in the front to entice them to go in there. Get these cigarettes and alcohol not going to school. So I want our young black men to be somebody and not be in jail. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Pastor Tony Larson. Did I? Okay. Pat Williams. Pat Williams, not Pat Willis, yeah. I'm here on behalf of the zoning. I live in the New Green Mount West community. Yeah, talk to the microphone. So get closer. Can you hear me now? Well, I just want to say, I'm for it. I'm, I'm, I'm for against some of the bars from closing in some places. There are too many bars in accession, different section of the city, but that's not their fault. That's the, the government, the city councilman, the state, whoever. It's not our fault. Well, the board or whoever. We're not going to have blames here like they got in Congress. We're going to try to come up with a solution. And my solution is to work together. Don't put folks out of their jobs. They work hard. Just like you come to work, you get paid. That's their livelihood, too. We need to consider that. And about the bars, I raised 134 children going past the bar every day. The bars help the kids with the drinks, sodas, that is, not looking beer. That wasn't allowed. And those kids turn out to be fantastic children. Out of 134, you can't say liquor is the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is we don't have enough facilities here to help them with the problem. Most of the people that drink, rob, they go to jail. When they come out of jail, where do they go? Back to the street because they didn't learn anything. But if most of them go out of the city to get help from becoming alcoholics and stuff like that. Although the store manager don't make them drink the liquor. The store manager don't make them rob nobody. The store manager don't make them stab nobody. It's up to the individual. I've seen people come from one end of the town to the other end of town. The problem was bought from one end, one end taken to the other. We have to learn how to work together and solve problems. And with the zoning, every time you turn around, there are changing zones. All this unnecessary zoning, it don't make no sense. It doesn't solve no problems. It don't solve not one problem. My time up. Well, thank you, and I just want to leave this one thought with us. If we fought as hard as we are for the things that we're doing now, for a little prayer for everybody, it'll be a big difference. Keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before the next person I call, I just want to acknowledge that we're joined by uh, Councilman Nick Mosby, and I think also you brought with you your wife, Marilyn Mosby's here tonight too. Okay. At this, uh, the next the next public testimony is Joyce Carney. Joyce Carney. Hello, my name is Joyce Carney. Speak into the mic. You have to speak into the microphone. My name is Joyce Carney. I live on Park Heights, the 3600 block of Park Heights. I agree that there are too many bars, too many liquor stores in the Park Heights area. I agree that there are too many liquor stores in the Park Heights area. However, that is not Park Heights' problem. All the efforts that we're putting into getting rid of liquor stores should be put into getting rid of drugs, and the drug dealers. We are infested. When you say killings, murders, homicides, you've never seen a drunk go up and say, give me your money. Pow! You've never seen a person that's just dependent upon liquor break in your house to get a fix. You've never seen a person who is dependent upon alcohol out in, when you say homicides and murders, you know it's drug Related. We need to start putting all of this effort that y'all got right here, all of these meetings, not in the liquor, but in getting some help for the Park Heights area, putting all of this effort and, and support from all over the world. In
get to getting rid of the main issue, drugs. If we get rid of the drugs, we're home free. We're home free. Thank you. Jordan, Jordan Holden, Jordan Holden. Hello, Councilman. Good my evening. Name, my name is Jordan Holden. Speak into the right there. My name is Jordan Holden, and I'm a sophomore at Baltimore City College. I live in the Northeast District, and I'm represented by Councilman Brandon Scott. Um, and although, and although, my district isn't heavily impacted by this legislation. I can speak for my peers who aren't here and didn't get the opportunity to make it here. And from my own experiences, I've stayed at my best friend's house who lives three doors down from a liquor store and a bar and have been there while her house has been broken into by a drunk man leaving the bar. And I can speak from my own experiences and say how scary that is to be there and to experience something like that. So I think that legislation like this would tremendously help people like her who is just a, not a victim, but is just somebody who has fallen a victim of her mother's, where her mother has placed her to live. So I think this would affect everybody in tremendous ways. Thank you. Mike, Mike Hilliard. Mike Hilliard. Yeah. Get, no, Mike Hilliard. I would like to thank the Land Use and Transportation Committee of the Baltimore City Council for hearing my testimony today. Can you get closer to the microphone, please? So we sure. Can... I am Mike Hilliard, the Community Services Director for the Harbell Community Organization Incorporated. Harbell is an umbrella organization serving Northeast Baltimore since 1970 that is composed of 80 member community associations, business associations, faith-based institutions, and businesses. It is a special honor to be able to address Councilwoman Mary Beck Clark, Councilman Brandon Scott, Councilman Warren Branch, and Councilman Bill Henry whom I have had the privilege of working with in addressing issues close to the hearts of Northeast Baltimore. I would also like to acknowledge the efforts of the Baltimore City Department of Planning, who under the able leadership of their director, Thomas Stoser, in conjunction with community and business leaders throughout the city, labored many hours to assemble the proposed revised zoning code. Harbell is very supportive of this effort and its work product. I would like to address the issue of liquor, liquor store amortization. Prior to coming to Harbell, I was privileged to serve the citizens of Baltimore as a member of its police department for 27 years. I can remember as a patrol officer, a sergeant, a lieutenant, and a major, insistently being concerned with what was occurring within and outside of liquor establishments. I cannot ever remember consistently being concerned about activity inside and outside of any other type of retail entity. Scrutinizing crime maps for the past 20 years, I have seen how crime clusters around liquor establishments. We also know from earlier testimony from the health commissioner that the proliferation of liquor licenses in an area has a detrimental impact on the public health of the surrounding community. If you, if you, I believe if you had a conversation with the leader of any community association in Northeast Baltimore, they would all indicate they feel their neighborhoods are inundated with liquor licensees. They would like to see the number of liquor licenses in the cities reduced. We realize that only the Board of Liquor License Commissioners of Baltimore City can eliminate licenses but this does not preclude the city from ensuring these establishments conform with the zoning code so they do not threaten a residential neighborhood's public health and safety. We would urge the Land Use and Transportation Committee to favorably recommend the entire proposed zoning code to the Baltimore City Council for passage 
including that portion that addresses liquor store amortization. Okay. Thank you. Mike, Mike, can we have a copy of your testimony? Essential? Okay, thank you. Um, if I'll pronounce this correctly. Pat Wills? Pat Wills? Will, the real, will Pat Wills stand up? Okay, can you hear me? I'm Patricia Goodlavage Wills, born in South Baltimore at the end of World War II on the corner of Austin and Charles Street. Raised in Brooklyn Park gives me the unique experience of living in the county and going to a city grade school and high school in the city. I rode buses for transportation and walked all over the city visiting relatives in O'Donnell Heights, Dundalk, the Liberty Road area, Drew Hill Park and the Baltimore Street area across from Patterson Park. My husband has owned a small printing business in Brooklyn for over 68 years and I've been part of it for 48 and a half years. I may be living in Linthicum for the past 48 years, but when I think, what should I do this weekend? I grab my free city newspapers and sightsee 95% of the time in the Baltimore City area, where my children live and my grandchildren travel from Laurel and Washington, D.C. to socialize in Canton and Federal Hill. That's my grandchildren, that's not me. There is no part of this city that I have not driven through or ridden buses on the past 50 years. I love the museums, the lacrosse fields, Drude Hill Park, Patterson Park, where I still buy my pierogies and stuffed cabbage from the same Ukrainian church that my Lithuanian and Polish father took me to since I was six years old. At the hearing at Morgan University, two juniors from Patterson Park High School spoke from their heart, and that's why I'm here today. Having a small business makes me very sympathetic with the other small businesses. But the law has been in effect for 40 years that the residential liquor stores were to be phased out and it's time for them to go. Even though these changes only affect one liquor store in the Brooklyn Curtis Bay area, we in Brooklyn and Curtis Bay need to support the other communities in the city. And to you small liquor stores, I say, don't blame the police when your customers hang out in front of your stores. Don't blame the city when your sidewalks and gutters are trashy. Blame yourself. With the diverse business owners in my block, we have owners from India, Jamaica, Pakistan, Korea, the Philippines, Nigeria, Cherry Hill, and Woodlawn. We have not let crime and grime take over and ruin our business area or the residents' lives. We don't let customers stand out in front or across the street and suck booze out of a brown paper bag or sell drugs in front of our businesses. Thank you. Oh, did I make it? Thank you. Uh, Shelly May, Shelly May. Huh? Hello, I'm Shelly May, and I've had uh, a lot of surgery, so I'm going to be brief. I can't stand long. You need to speak into a microphone a little bit higher. Thank you. Oh, okay. I will talk really loud for you. <laughs> Thank you. I've been looking at this issue for a long time. I moved to Michigan after being a Baltimore born, bred, raised, and everything else. And this was a wonderful city. However, when I returned, I found just despair. And the despair was really Park Heights. It was the attitude of people who just wanted money. Most of the people in here, if they could have had some kind of, you if they had, right, yeah. okay, I love all your faces anyway. Um, if people in this room on the other side had income, had legacies, maybe came from somewhere else in America or where else, they would look at what they were doing in terms of their business, not have everybody on top of each other. I drive down Price to Town Road every day. I have never, anywhere I have traveled, seen so many on the side of houses, in great big lots, just liquor store after liquor store after liquor store. A good businessman doesn't saturate himself in an already saturated market. 
I would beg you to think about your neighborhoods, your areas. How many bars would you like where you live? One every block? One every two blocks? I hear you saying you have them, but do you have all the rest that go with it? Okay, that's a difference. We know that neighborhoods, other neighborhoods have bars, but nothing, nothing can equal what we have here. Do the best you can, do what the people of Park Heights elected you to do, and that is to take care of our needs, wants, and concerns. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Rajiv Bomar Kanti. Hi, good evening. My good name evening. is Raj Bomakanti. Uh, I have my business owner in Fells Point. Um, I, I have no doubt that this is a multifaceted co uh, problem, and it needs a holistic solution. When we have a toe fracture, we don't amputate the whole leg, do we? Similarly, there are problem areas, problem bars, and problem stores that needs to be addressed individually, but not with a blanket solution. Down in Fells Point, we have many problems. Vagrancy, we are affected by the same bombs that you are affected. And we, we, we are working with the police, we are working with uh, Councilman Kraft, thank you for the leadership, and we are working with the community associations and other organizations, city organizations, to solve the problem, to have a holistic solution. Similarly, I request the council to have an open mind when you consider this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Fur Holden. Deborah Fur Holden. Third time, Deborah Fur Holden. Um, Shabner Wood. Shabner Wood, W A R D. Is that Sabrina? Sabrina Wood. Sabrina Wood. Uh, Jung Lee. This is uh, Bariyadi, uh, the old, the Dennis and Rico. Uh, yeah, have we finished with nine? Yeah. Yeah, we have one more page. Does she need an interpreter or she's speaking in English? Yeah, I need an interpreter, yeah. Uh, yeah, but we, we, we got a few, couple one more page to do. We don't do it. Baltimore City, John Hopkins research, the results are done. The zoning plan is done. We are working in this place. But I think the family store or the family store is done in the United States. Well, the City Council have the plan of the changing zoning only with a result by one university, uh, John Hopkins, uh, a search. And uh, but we are family, store, uh, uh, this thing can happen to anybody and everybody nationwide. Uh, John Hopkins has researched a system. 어느 어느 칸트리 어느 미국 이세 이 지구상의 어느 곳에서나 설치를 하면 그런 결과가 나올 수 있다고 생각합니다. I believe that the uh, whatever comes that came out of this research by the John Hopkins uh, can come out anywhere, any place on in this uh, world and uh, on Earth. Uh, 
보리스맨들이 얼마나 열심히 일을 하는지 지금 가게 안이나 가게 밖에는 사람이 없습니다. 그런데 그런 모든 것은 제가 아까 지금 여태 쭉 들은 것은 그런 모든 것이 리코스토아 때문에 약이 있고 크람이 있다고 지금 들었습니다. I heard that uh, all these uh, problems, including drugs and other crimes, are uh, the liquor store are to blame, and that's you know, that. Uh, as a matter of fact, that we don't. It's a police work, and uh, there aren't enough police forces in and out. If you don't believe what I said, just said, that come out and uh, take a look at yourself, and uh, I would appreciate that effort very much. And we pay tax, property taxes every year, all kind of taxes every year. We not, we're not wasting or we're not taking your tax money. I don't know whether I'm allowed to mention white and black, but uh, you know, I have a business in Munson area. We love black people. We are friends with black people. She, I, I'm a citizen of this country. This country is the land of, of, of human rights yeah, and freedom. And I'm very proud of being a member of this, as a citizen of this country. Yeah, that, I have, that, that was the two minutes. We already gave you four minutes, so, yeah. okay? そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そう、そ
how this drug is impacting the community. And my, my position is this. I understand businesses don't have anything uh, to do with it being anti-business. This is anti-people, especially the generations of people that this is impacting. When you look at, you can look at all the uh, scientific evidence. We had John Hopkins, it's been a numerous of studies. It goes down to this. What are we gonna do and how are we going to do it to come to some type of reasonable resolution? We can sit up here and play the blame game all day long and say the liquor board didn't do this, the zoning commission didn't do that, but we're here today for one reason, and that reason is to see what you're going to do. This is in your committee. You can either stand up and address the issues and the concerns of the community, or you can run and hide and kick rocks, you understand, and pretend that this doesn't exist. And this is a community grant. If you don't get the message tonight, don't think that this sleeping giant won't awake when 2016 comes. I know you think that communities have community amnesia. But trust and believe, those of us who are in the community, we know who you are. And whether you got a conflict of interest or whatever the case might be, we won't forget you. You know what I mean? When 2016 come around, trust and believe we will not forget you. And I know you. sometimes you say, well, mostly these establishments are probably you're thinking they're in communities of people that are not on your van, yeah, you may have some I truth to that. But I can tell you that, I can tell you this one thing. Speaker, just give me one, give what me, uh, yeah, just a closing. Ahead. What this last okay. statement? I'm, I'm probably hit some nerves there. Just be on point that nobody's is safe come 2016. Okay? Just be aware of that. All right. Thank you. What it is, everybody has two minutes. We're trying to oh, wrap this up. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Uh, I guess it's Oscar. I'm Roberta Bols Smith. Huh? I'm Roberta Smith. You called me. You called my name. Roberta Smith? Yes, you did. Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead, you're good, you're good. Okay, I'm, I'm Roberta Smith, and I'm from Emerson Village area. I've lived in my house for 40 years. I can sit in my dining room and see how my neighborhood has changed. Up and down, up and down, up and down, getting the liquor. I'm here to ask you to think, go into your heart, when you lay down at night, are you comfortable? Are you worrying about somebody coming out of that liquor store and doing something wrong? The fault lies with not everyone, not some people, but everybody to cure a problem. I would like to see all of these corner liquor stores. I'm not concerned about a bar. I'm concerned about the stores that sell the liquor daily. I would like to see those stores close in neighborhoods by 8 o'clock at night and be closed all day on Sunday. And if you want liquor, go to it on the highway and get your liquor. I don't know this gentleman sitting here with these glasses on with the blue shirt. And I, this is the first time I have seen you but you have a smirk about you that this is not a serious problem. And take it from me, if it affects us, it will soon affect you because nothing stays nowhere long. I am pleading with you to close the stores early and to close them on Sunday and think about the people that are just laying on those stores all day long, 
one bottle, two bottles, three bottles. And the last thing I will send, say to you is, think about it. When we put our trust in something else besides that man sitting next to you, our lives and our neighborhoods were better. Look up, people. You better change your ways. Thank you. Thank you. Douglas, Douglas McLean. Douglas McLean. Roberta Smith. No, 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 no. Lena Horn. Lena Leone. Okay, yeah. Lena Leone. Hello. Um, my name is Lena Leone. I'm from Greenmount West Public Safety Committee. Um, I've lived in Greenmount West for over 10 years. Um, I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old. Oh, get up. Okay. Greenmount West is 16 square blocks with a church and two schools that have kids that ain't rage in age from three year old, three years old through high school that come from all over Baltimore City. Most of these kids walk by this non-conforming liquor store multiple times okay. a day. Our community is consistent with the statistics where our most violent crime, shootings and stabbings in the neighborhood have occurred within a block of the non-conforming liquor store. There's also a thriving drug market within half a block. This is the only entity in our neighborhood where people get to sit behind bulletproof glass. Alcoholism runs rampant in our community. We have people who come to our neighborhood, hang out all, all day, drink on the stoops of unoccupied houses because this non-conforming liquor store opens at 8 a.m. Just in the past few weeks, we've had three flat tires on our block because of broken vodka bottles. And trash and large-scale dumping is an issue in and around this property. The bottles are a result of many parties that include alcohol, drugs, and loud music that happen all week long and go on till 3 to 4 a.m. We do not also do not have a grocery store in our neighborhood. Our community association, the new Greenmount West Community Association, took a vote and a majority of the residents support Bill 12-0152 regarding the non-conforming liquor stores. What I'm asking is for the city council to do its job and the zoning board to okay. do its job that they failed to do in 1971. The density your, of alcohol stores your time is, is up not you, healthy. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Your Thank, time you. Is up. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. What I'm going to do, because we're running late and they want to get out of here, um, just stand in line behind a microphone, Oscar Cobbs. Lisa, Lisa O'Reilly, Joan Floyd, Diane Corbett, Pete Packus, Mary, I guess it's Mary Alexander, and uh, Lynn Sharks. So again, Oscar, who's that, Oscar? Oscar Cobbs is first. What do you say? Good evening, city council members. Uh, my name is Oscar Cobbs. I represent the Park Heights Renaissance. Uh, our board chair is not here, so as the assistant board chair, I'm saying standing in for it. As you know, Park Heights Renaissance uh, has taken the, the lead in trying to deal with this liquor issue. Uh, we've gotten stuff, legislation done in the past. We want legislation done in the future. Uh, talking about closing the liquor stores early, having them open up late, and all that. So my issue, though, is this. And no one has said anything about it, so I will. 
Uh, if you go into the 5100 block of Park Heights Avenue, you will find six liquor stores. Now, there was a thing that the doctor put up there about in 300, you can't have a liquor store within 300 feet of one another. Well, how are you going to have a block where it has six liquor stores and that's not a relevant issue? So I'm just saying uh, something is desperately wrong there. If you got six liquor stores in a one block area and there's a law downtown that says you can't have one 300 feet from one another. So that's an issue. My final issue is, is that when these liquor stores close up, Park Heights is in a building program, revitalization program. Uh, we want new members. The mayor wants new people. I'm saying to these liquor store owners, I would suggest that when you close up your liquor stores, that you start finding residency in the Park Heights community. Thank you. Next. Good evening, Council. My name is Lisa O'Reilly. I'm the president of York Homeland Association. I'm a member of the York Road Partnership uh, Leaders uh, Committee. I'm here as a member of BUILD. I work in uh, Councilman Scott's area. Um, I'm wearing a lot of hats. So, but the last hat I'm going to wear is my Irish hat. Uh, Bill and I have had a drink many a time. I love drink. Of course I do. Not sure, not sure. Who doesn't like a drink? But I have to say to you, thank you, Ms. Spectre. We'll go for one ourselves. But I have to say to you, I'm 12 years living in this town. I have watched outside my front door, I've had watched Vlalix disappear because of community effort to get rid of a liquor store that was bringing us down. Thank you, Michelle, you know what I'm talking about. We put together an MOU for the new owner of that premises, and Jen has done an amazing job to be a good member of our community. So to say that all liquor stores who are out of compliance, they're stuck. I wish the stadium owner people were still here because I would like to say to their face, you are a good member of our community in Waverley. Stadium, the stadium lounge. However, my point is this. The proliferation of licenses within vomiting distance of each other is immoral, it is wrong, and I don't understand how this city is able to have four liquor licenses within that distance, three liquor licenses right beside each other in your code in the 5400 block. I don't understand how that happens. One of which is a B7 that does not act as a B7. I don't understand why that is not on this list. Why York Road Tavern is not on this list is beyond me. That place, is it on the list? Well, I'm here to protest its closure. That place is directly responsible for making You're people alcoholics. Yeah. I'll wind up and I'll talk to you afterwards about how many alcoholics are made out of these establishments. People don't choose to go to a liquor store after they become an alcoholic. They're there because they can't do anything else. It's wrong that I see people at six o'clock in the morning hanging, waiting for a liquor store to open. And that same person is there at four in the morning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Joan Floyd, President of Remington Neighborhood Alliance. This evening's debate about the fate of non-conforming packaged goods stores in row house blocks is one, of, one very small piece of a much larger issue, and that is what will be our future public policy regarding the non-residential use of properties on row house blocks. While the lines seem to be clearly drawn on this one issue of packaged goods stores, and the proposed code sets forth an absolute course of future action, for us to see and debate tonight, the same cannot be said for other parts of the proposed new code. I believe most people, are unaware of the increased methods being proposed to add just about every kind of retail but packaged goods stores to row house blocks. I believe most people are unaware of the long list of commercial uses proposed for row house neighborhoods under the quote neighborhood commercial end quote banner. I believe most people are unaware of the proposed new RMU overlay zone which permits the same long list of commercial uses 
and I believe most people are unaware of the way minimum lot area requirements are being relaxed, which in combination with unlimited variances will encourage the commercialization of row house blocks. These things were not expected or not being discussed. And not one of the new commercial C zones excludes packaged goods stores or taverns. Did you know that? When I mentioned that recently at a meeting of active community leaders, no one was aware of this aspect of the plan. Unless this is amended in the future, wherever a C district overlaps or adjoins a row house block, there is the possibility of having a new packaged goods store or a new tavern open up right next door to someone's home for the new, in the new code the way it's written. These proposed innovations provide a very different picture from what we have today under our current code. We need to discuss and debate the larger issue of future non-residential uses on row house blocks, just as the issue of packaged goods stores is being singled out for tonight's discussion and debate. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Good evening. That's all good to say. Good evening. My name Good is evening. My name is Diane Corbett. I'm coming from Southeast Baltimore. And um, for 45 you need, you need to talk into the microphone. I am getting ready to talk into okay. the mic. Um, everybody says 1970. I can look at it and say in 45 years, I have seen my neighborhoods decline. And I mean across the city, just not East Baltimore. Northeast Baltimore, by Warburg Junction. Uh, Park Heights. I hung up in there when I was in high school, and I see all these liquor stores that came about, and I see it's not just the liquor stores, but other things, but we discussed in liquor stores right now, so I'm not going to pacify and say, well, the other things cause it. I am in support of Bill 12-0152, because I have seen the devastation in my community, how jobs have left the community, and liquor stores have come into the community and had made, you know, you got all the um, reports from the health department, and from John Hopkins and everything like that. But I just want to say that we need jobs in our community instead of more liquor stores. We have enough liquor stores. The ones that we have are not supporting the community because if they did, the communities wouldn't look the way they look with a lot of vacant houses. Because if you're a good business person, I don't care if you're a man or woman, you will give back to that community and make sure that community come up and it has not happened. And like I said, it's been 45 years. And I'm, four years from now, I'll be 60, and I don't want to see my grandson going through the same issue that we're going through today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Pete? Mm -hmm. Honorable members of the Land Use and Transportation Committee, my name is Pete Packus. I come before you wearing two hats. The first is that of president of the Glen Oaks Improvement Association and past president of the Northeast Community Organization, NECO. Although we do not have the concentration of packaged stores and bars facing our sister associations throughout the city, we stand in solidarity with them tonight. My other hat is from five years as CPHA director of special projects 15 years ago organizing the Baltimore Citywide Liquor Coalition in two monumental organization struggles. One very successful, the other not so much. The first project was the elimination of alcohol and tobacco billboards from all but the highest commercial and industrial zone areas of the city. In other words, the residential and local business areas where the billboards were viewed nonstop by children every day with no means of parental control. CPHA and the Baltimore Citywide Liquor Coalition's organizing at the state legislature level gave the Baltimore City Council the power to pass pioneering zoning ordinance, the ordinances that brought down the alcohol and tobacco billboards. And as the less effective of the, of the second project, I visited the Liquor Board weekly to present concerns and petitions of 10 residents in the immediate vicinity of liquor establishments during the year and challenging the licenses in March at, for the April hearings over a five-year period with marginal results. Enforcement alone was not the answer then, nor is it now with a dysfunctional liquor board. My point, honorable members of the committee, 
is that no one has to go to Annapolis now for permission. It's in your hands to once again call upon the power of zoning to eliminate a blight upon this city. The power is again in your hands. Yeah, Mr. Packers, time's Simply up. Simply pass the bill without a member. Thank, Thank you. you. Can you give us a copy of your written testimony, please? Okay, we have, um, we have Mary Alexander and then we have Mr. Hanna, and I think that's everybody that's time to... I'm sorry? Okay, we'll get you... Okay, go ahead, Ms. Alexander. Okay, good evening. My name is Mary Alexander. I live in Baltimore City. I've been, been here all my life. I humbly request on behalf of the future of all young people in this great city that the council, specifically the Land Use um, Committee, vote yes and allow the bill to come to some kind of vote. And I ask that the um, council people please vote yes. I am too, truly in support of this bill. On behalf of those who could not be here today, I live in the 13th district. I vote very on a regular basis, and I just want to tell my councilman branch, you know, when we were, when we were young and we didn't know no better, we thought that going to those liquor stores and those taverns was a great thing to do. But I work at Mercy, and I'm a therapist. I'm going to tell you, a lot, a lot of those things, those residual problems from drinking all those years, we need to grow up a little bit. I'm there when people got the cancers and the strokes and the other problems where they can't walk anymore. And I don't think that, that, that keeping these taverns open is a great thing to do. And that's my personal opinion. I've told you about it a couple of times, and I want you to vote yes on behalf. Because people think, yes, the golden rule say whoever has the gold rules. But I think that the, the other golden rule on this is that whoever gets the most votes win. And if we don't vote for you, you don't win. And most of you who say no against this bill is really taking a stab and saying a no against our children, specifically my grandchildren. I will be inclined to vote, excuse me, not vote for you and to work very hard against you and to make sure that we will be very resolved about this. We're not going to slap five tonight. We're not going to get all excited tonight. We're going to have a resolve. So, during, you know, for whatever reason, I see you smiling at me, for whatever reason, if I have to go and keep this alive, I will keep this alive for okay. 2016. So in closing, I would just ask that you please consider the young people who live around these neighborhoods and in our, in our district. I think this is a very serious issue, and I know that you vote for the right thing, right? You and I will may, may disagree on a lot of things, but I want you to vote on behalf of the children in the future, okay? Okay, no problem. And in my closing, I want to make sure that we kind of kind of work out some of these words in some way. Man, you're taking up my time. Miss, I'm getting some extra seconds. Mr. Alexander, don't engage in... Okay, well, he took up some of my time. The one thing I don't care if a person is Asian, black, or white, these liquor stores have a negative, negative impact on our children and our health. Just like the propaganda that was out back when it came to the time for people to discuss what was going on and how HIV was spreading, people didn't believe the studies either. But now I would ask you all to please consider and take into consideration the studies that show that this is devastating for our community, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and Ms. Alexander, um, I can assure you that uh, the, the Councilman Branch has all of us take everything that's being said here very seriously this evening and we'll consider all of it. Thank you. Mr. Good Hanna. evening, uh, City Council members. Uh, my name is Will Hanna. I'm the President and CEO of the New Park Heights Community Development Corporation. Um, prior to that, I served seven years as a legal analyst for the U.S. Department of Justice. So I have some questions as, as it relates from an analytical standpoint. Does this uh, bill, because we want to support this, but I want to, does this bill in any way conflict with Article 2B of the state code? M Mr. Nelson addressed that earlier this evening. Okay, that's a good question. There, are, there aren't a lot of things in Park Heights that many of us, particularly me and Mr. Colon, not a whole lot of things that we agree on, but this issue alone, I can say primarily, we have stood steadfast on this one issue about liquor stores in Park Heights. There are 43 liquor establishments in Park Heights, but there are 88 licenses in Park Heights. 88 liquor licenses. Mr. Hanna addressed the committee. I am. I'm looking Thank right you. at you. Okay. <laughs> okay. There are 88 licenses in Park Heights. And the numbers that were stated earlier was that there should be a liquor license per thousand. If you look at 88 licenses per 30,000 people in Park Heights, it comes out to a license for every 400 people in Park Heights. Every 400 people, there is a liquor license in this community. That is, that is far more, that is twice as, as, as bad 
as the national average, part of it. The other thing is, prime example to, and I want y'all to consider this, there was an issue with a liquor establishment at Park Heights and Hayward, the Blue Caribbean. So this, there was an issue there for years. People hung out on the corners there. A lot of drug activity was there for years. And Brandon, Brandon well, Councilman Scott, you know, for years, and, and I want to thank Councilman Scott and Michelle, who worked on this issue for years in Park Heights. But the establishment that was there at Park Heights and Hayward. Mr. Hanna, that's your time. Okay. I just thank want to you. say this one real quick. Real Very quick. quickly. We addressed it differently. We actually approached the liquor establishment and asked them not to sell things in the store that would attract anyone under 21. As a result of that, drive up Park Heights and Hayward today. That's all. That's my thing. Thank you. Mr. Sandtown Winchester, I didn't get your name, but I did get where you were from. <laughs> my name is Lynn Harris, and I'm president of the Sandtown Winchester Improvement Association. Uh, greetings to all you councilmen and councilwomen. I come to you on behalf of the mothers who have lost their children in the Sandtown Winchester community. I'm going to take you through the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000, 2010. All I know about these bars and taverns is death, crime. That's all I've seen. Today when I step out into my neighborhood, that's what I see. Across from Gilmore Elementary School, there's a bar diagonal across the street. We must eliminate all these bars in our neighborhoods because all they are are death traps. It's been since the 50s up to, the, up to today, and we need to eliminate all of them because they are no good, they're not productive, there's not enough disposable income in Sandtown to support them. So my, my feeling is make an amendment, get rid of all of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the next full hearing on City Council Bill 120152, Transform Baltimore Zoning, will be held on Wednesday, October 9th at 6.30 p.m. at the University of Maryland Biopark, located at 600 West Baltimore Street. Titles 10 and 12, Commercial Districts and Special Purpose Districts, will be the topic during this hearing. Thank you all for attending. I'm re uh, hold on one second. I've got, that's the address I have, 801? 800 801 West Baltimore Street. Thank you all for attending today's Land Use and Transportation Committee hearing. Please check the area around your seat to make certain you have everything to brought with you. We'll be closing the room shortly and ask that everyone exit promptly. The committee stands in recess until October 9th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you.